Hi everyone, my name is Stanley and today I'm going to be talking about a few great alternatives to Fujifilm's extremely popular X100 series. To give some context for this video, Fujifilm's current X100 series camera, the X100V, or 5th generation X100, is out of stock everywhere at the moment and is being sold at prices much higher than the MSRP of $1400. It's not uncommon to see listings marked up by $500 or even $1000. For those who were familiar with the graphics card market of 2021, this might ring a bell. The main difference, however, is that if you really needed a high-end graphics card right there and then, there was basically no other option other than to pay the higher price. In this situation, however, there are actually a lot of amazing alternatives you can consider rather than trying to buy an X100V right now. In fact, just regarding supply issues and marked up prices, I think these are some amazing alternatives, period. I'll first begin by mentioning a few reasons why the X100 series is so popular. One, it takes beautiful pictures with the built-in 23mm f2 lens. Two, it's compact, you can easily take it with you as an everyday carry. Three, it has a lot of fun factor by having an optical viewfinder rather than just a normal EVF. Four, it has a cool looking rangefinder body. And lastly, it's a beautiful camera that is bound to inspire conversation, compliments, or both. By these standards, there are a few cameras that I can recommend that you also consider. The first comes from Fujifilm's own lineup, the X-Pro series, in particular the X-Pro2 and the X-Pro3. The X-Pro series cameras are similar to the X100 line in many ways. They have similar sensors and that they are also beautiful rangefinder cameras. But they also have a few added professional features such as dual card slots and an interchangeable lens mount. You don't have to be stuck with the built-in lens that the X100 has. Of course, the trade-off is that the X-Pro cameras are slightly bigger and you do lose a bit of the compactness, especially when paired with bigger lenses. But speaking of compactness, a major advantage for me was being able to attach M-mount lenses. For example, this is a 35mm f1.4 from Voigtlander. This lens is tiny. This is even full frame, and if you're looking for a native APS-C lens, Voigtlander and other companies have even more compact options. Basically, this opens up a world of possibilities when you're able to attach so many native and adapted lenses compared to just having one option. My first Fujifilm camera was actually the original X100. I had an amazing experience with the camera, but ended up switching to the X-Pro2 and eventually the X-Pro3 for this reason. The X-Pro3 in particular creates a really fun purist experience by also hiding the monitor. It's also weather sealed and extremely durable. It also has a scratch resistant finish on the titanium models. The second recommendation I have is a camera that I've come to really love, the Ricoh GR3. The GR3 is really tiny. Despite how small the X100 is, it's not a pocket camera. If you do manage to stuff it in a pocket, it's not gonna feel comfortable. Compared to the X100, the GR3 has the same sensor size, also uses a leaf shutter, and has an insanely sharp 18mm f2.8 lens, which is wider than Fujifilm's 23 f2. This tends to be a little bit better for documentary coverage of everyday life. Even better, this camera also offers in-body image stabilization, something none of Fujifilm's rangefinder cameras have. You can shoot at slow shutter speeds and still walk away with very sharp images. In terms of color, the GR3 creates beautiful JPEGs that are just as customizable as Fujifilm's. I don't think that this camera is as pretty as the X100, but that's not the point of this camera. The GR3 is geared towards being a low-key, nondescript camera, perfect for documentarian purposes and street photography. Best of all, nobody would even notice if you're taking a photo. I found that this has been such a luxury to have when I really want to create images without the pressure of people being aware of you doing so. The third recommendation I have is the Leica M series rangefinders, specifically the Leica M240, the M10, and the M11. Compared to the X100's digital rangefinder, the Leica M still has an actual mechanical rangefinder. What this means is that when you mount a lens onto your M series camera, it becomes mechanically coupled to your focusing mechanism and all focusing must be done manually. This might sound pretty annoying, but it's actually a really easy way to focus once you get the hang of it. I think it's actually much easier and more intuitive than focus peaking. In our modern era of high autofocus and AI powered 
focusing algorithms, this creates a really unique experience that no other modern camera can provide. You'll really need to be fully committed to understanding all the focusing modes that this camera has. And by all the focusing modes, I mean just manual focus. Like I said though, it is easier once you get the hang of it. In fact, if you properly zone focus, you'll be able to capture moments faster than using any form of autofocus technology. That being said, Leica M's are also full frame and will naturally give you full frame image quality. The lenses are also magical in that they give you such great image quality while being absolutely tiny. One negative for portability, however, is that the Leica M's are much heavier because they're often built like dense bricks. They're pretty compact, but they are surprisingly heavy. On the topic of build quality, these cameras are all handmade and have exceptional build quality. I believe that the cost premium that the Leica cameras command stems primarily from this. The image output is fantastic, but almost all cameras nowadays will give us nothing to complain about. My last recommendation also comes from Leica. If you wanted the build quality of a Leica, but didn't want to sacrifice the convenience of having an electronic viewfinder and autofocus, then I'd recommend a Q2. The Q2 is basically Leica's version of a compact premium point and shoot, similar to where the X100V sits for Fujifilm. The main difference in camera style is that the Q2 is not a rangefinder. The Q2 also has a high resolution full frame sensor with an exceptional 28 millimeter f1.7 lens that is also stabilized. In terms of field of view, it's similar to the Ricoh GR3 with the 18 millimeter APS-C lens, which will be a bit wider than the X100s. It's also weather sealed and uses a near silent leaf shutter, similar to the GR3 and the X100. Camera overall is still very compact, but the lens protrudes quite a bit more compared to the X100. These are my four alternatives to the Fujifilm X100 series. But another important point to consider is cost. I personally always recommend considering buying used gear as you'll be able to save a lot in the long run. So my costs will be ranges that consider both new and used options. The MSRP of the X100V is $1,400, but the marked up price of any available model, new or used at the moment, is anywhere from $1,700 to well over $2,000. Of course, this will go back down to normal later on, but it's just something to consider for the moment. This compares very similarly to the X-Pro3, which can be had from $1,200 to $2,000, depending on if you buy used or choose the more expensive titanium models. Even cheaper would be a used X-Pro2. On the other hand, the Arico GR3 would be much cheaper from $600 to $900. The Leica M bodies will be more expensive, ranging from $2,000 to $9,000, depending on the particular model that you get and the condition. Similarly, depending on the model and condition, the Leica Q2 sits around $4,000 to $6,000. Of course, you'll also have to factor in the additional lens costs for the X-Pro series and the Leica M series, since lenses are not included. On the other hand, the X100, the GR3, and the Q2 have a lens built in. To some, it might not make sense for me to recommend cameras that are an entirely different price point, but all of these cameras are essentially luxury point and shoots at different price levels. They are a luxury because professional photographers that buy cameras strictly out of necessity will be buying whole systems from Sony, Canon, and Nikon instead. But if you have the extra cash to be considering getting a compact personal camera for fun, all of these options aren't too far apart in overall cost. Another way to think about these costs is the actual cost of ownership over time or long-term rental cost. Take for example, I buy a used X100V right now for $2,000 instead of the MSRP of $1,400. One year later, assuming supply levels return to normal, the market value for a used X100V becomes even lower than the MSRP since the camera is readily available. I would probably have to sell it for $1,200 or less, which means I'll eat a loss of at least $800 in depreciation and have an overall cost of $800 in one year. That is really expensive. Of course, if it were available at MSRP now, my cost would be around $200 for a year, which is not bad. Another example is that I bought the original X100 used in 2015 for $450. If I had instead bought the X100 at its original MSRP of $1,200 in 2010 and then sold it in 2015 for $450, then my cost per year would have been around $100. I did end up selling that camera for $400 in 2017, so that basically made my cost of ownership only $25 per year. I'm not saying that the X100V is a bad camera, on the contrary, it's an amazing, compact, luxury camera. But 
I only think that it's worth it if it's at MSRP or below because we have so many other in stock and available options. Anyways, I hope this comparison and cost analysis helped you out or was at least interesting to hear. If you have any other perspectives, feel free to leave them down in the comments below for discussion. That's it for today. See you all next time. Hi everyone, my name is Stanley and today I'm going to be talking about a few great alternatives to Fujifilm's extremely popular X100 series. This dog just burned.